Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening if you are in Asia. My name is Loretta Law. I am chairing this uh, Scientech Asia seminar today. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Professor Tak Watanabe, who is an associate professor of anthropology at Sofia University in Tokyo. And his research focuses on the anthropology of environment, environmental issues ranging from mining, pollution, fisheries, river management, and urban ecology, with a particular focus on Japan. And today his talk is about community expertise and the politics of water pollution in Japan. So without further ado, I'll pass the platform to uh, Professor Watanabe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Loretta. Um, let me share my screen. I need to do this again. Uh, uh, okay, I think, I hope everyone can see this, right? Um, so hi, everyone. Th and thank you, um, uh, Loretta and uh, Rosal for inviting me and Nijen, of course, for inviting me to this, to give this talk. Um, it's eight o'clock in the evening at Tokyo right now. So um, I'm a little bit tired for, for uh, a day's work, but um, let me uh, just um, go on with this presentation, which is called The Bypass is Cheating, Community Expert Knowledge and the Secret Politics of Water Pollution in Contemporary Japan. Um, I'm an anthropologist teaching at Sofia University, which is located in Tokyo. And, um, I should begin, this is the sort of the agenda for today, but today I wanted to just, before I go on, just mention two things. One is that the, the first part, which is about this Osumari River, um, is a uh, based on a collaborative and I guess in a way participatory research project. That's not really a research project, but it involves many people. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. And the second part, this uh, the last part, which is about Hokkaido, and salmon fishers is based on another collaborative research project that is um, that I that I'm doing with Professor Takeshi Ito, who is uh, uh, at Sofia University as well, and we have this project on salmon. So I just wanted to acknowledge that before I begin. Um, I prepared a one hour long um, lecture, but I wanted to shorten it, so I'm going to go rather quickly and. Um, might even skip some things. So if there are things that you want to, um, you want me to cover, I guess, at the end of the presentation, please um, let me know during the Q&A session. Okay, so um, the first part of this, um, this part one, I will just be reading an ethnographic story with a sort of a slideshow. So please sit back, relax, and listen. Uh, so, a bypass is cheating by adults. So whispered the school children in the back of the room. So as not to disturb the adults listening to a presentation by a landscape architect. Um, the children ages 10 to 12 and their teachers kept their voices down. This was the last day in a series of citizen workshops that had convened about 10 times over the course of 15 months a few years back. The architect was explaining his team's design for the Dream Waterway, later renamed Osonoi River, a project to restore and make accessible a 100 meter creek in a park near the headwaters of an urban stream in Tokyo, Japan. So what is a bypass? Asked one child and the teacher explained softly, barely audible. Why is a bypass needed? Asked another child. Why can't they just clean the water? Said the third. This muffled exchange was drowned by the voice of the architect who was pointing to the technical drawings hanging behind him. The audience consisted of about 60 people from the local area, from children as young as seven to retirees in their eighties and from different professional backgrounds, teachers, writers, scientists, civic leaders, government workers, city planners, river engineers, activists. These workshop participants had volunteered their time to learn about the area and hash out design principles for this waterway. The workshop was an innovative experiment in civic participation and environmental restoration, a style of decision-making that strives to include local voices in the planning of public spaces. 
But it was the children, the school children, however, who had first conceived of the project for this neglected waterway. The design process began with students of a local elementary school, uh, which had an integrated environmental education program that focused on this urban river, which also happened to run through the school ground. At the school, a river restoration case mentioned in their textbook inspired the children to imagine the possibility of restoring the river that runs through their schoolyard, a river which is deeply channelized, we'll talk about this term later, uh, filled with raw sewage and impossible to access because of the fence that surrounds it over its 12 kilometer, kilometer span. Uh, with the help of ecologists and engineers, the children learned about the urban hydrological cycle, the water cycle, that is. In the river, they collected garbage and conducted hot water quality tests and biological surveys. And the students drafted with colored pens and paper their dream image of a waterway, banks covered in green and children swimming along fish and water birds. After completing their drawings, the students paid a visit to the mayor of the ward government to submit their drawings and ask the government to realize their plans. Unbeknownst to the children, however, years of planning by a loose network of activists, volunteers, scientists, environmentalists, politicians, and community leaders had made, po made possible this meeting with the mayor. And a few months later, the ward government decided to add the children's vision into their overall master plan for their, uh, for their ward and earmarked the budget and called for this citizen workshop. The children rejoiced and their success was widely publicized in the media. Yet, at this presentation during the workshop, a year after their meeting with the mayor, the children were perplexed. Most of the features that the children wanted was reflected in the landscape architect's blueprint, an accessible stream, and lots of wildlife. The architects also worked with ecologists to catalog the species of birds, fish, insects, and plants in the waters, and the hydrologists to investigate water quality, flow amount, and the water table. These hired experts, however, determined that for this water to be a healthy ecosystem, as well as sufficiently safe for children to play in, it would need a constant and heavy flow of clean water. And that was the problem because in the current setting, the incoming water was very polluted. Now, let me try to explain what that means. The water connects two ponds with the upper pond polluted by years of low water flow, storm water runoffs from surrounding surfaces, invasive species, such as koi, which is carp fish, and people who have tossed in all kinds of food to feed them. From the upper pond, this polluted water enters the waterway and there was seemingly no other way to provide clean water other than diverting the dirty water around the children's creek and supplying the water from a different cleaner water source. The question that the children posed uh, is one that the other workshop participants over the course of the year had also raised perhaps in a more diplomatic way. Solutions too were suggested for improving the water quality of the upper pond, pulling in more water from outside the watershed, eradicating invasive species, starting a campaign to stop the feeding of koi and kaibori, which is a traditional uh, dredging method originally practiced by farmers and now used to improve the water quality of urban ponds. These solutions, however, were, un were unfeasible because the Tokyo Metropolitan Government's Park Division and not the ward government had jurisdiction over the upper pond. So the landscape architect had to devise a bypass that would physically divert bad water, the polluted water, while metaphorically passing over the jurisdictional impasse. It was a clear solution to a seemingly insurmountable problem. For the children, however, this bypass made no sense. The bypass in effect ignored the natural flow of water by removing the waterway from the rest of the river as a kind of artificial tributary. Rather than unmasking, uh, rather than the unnatural task of constructing an entirely new flow regime, cleaning up the upper pond was a more obvious idea for the children and for the non-experts in the room. Thus the bypass would divert the dirty water from the upper to the lower pond, avoiding the dream waterway. The landscape architect explained that a water diversion tunnel would be constructed, bypassing the new waterway, and a new pump would be installed so that clean groundwater can be used to supply water. 
This way, it can remain clean enough for people to enter the water and for wildlife to flourish. But the children could not understand the adults. Now, why can't they just clean the upper pond? That's unfair. It's cheating. This is the word that they used in Japanese. It's zurui, bypass wa zurui. From the perspective of the children, the solution was so clever that it may have appeared to be devious. Now, um, if cheating is an act of transgression without being caught or penalized, this bypass appeared to the children as breaking the law of nature, in particular, the hydrological principles they learned and confirmed by the common sense understanding that water flows downstream. Not being able to appreciate the difficulty of interjurisdictional cooperation, they saw the bypass solution as one that is con convenient for adults in the political games that they play. And contained in this playground language of you cheated was a critique of adult logic concerning water governance in Tokyo. They felt that it would be easier and more natural to clean the upper pond than build a whole new bypass. And it was a pond that they had, to, they had visited for nature classes, so they wanted to see a cleaner pond anyway. In hearing this exchange between the children and the teachers, I found myself nodding in agreement. The bypass would end up literally burying the many problems with the water quality of this waterway and for the river and ultimately the ocean that the water flows into. Of those many problems, one stands out in particular. The water pollution has never been addressed by the government because of the legal consequences of such an acknowledgement. The water pollution is a secret that is again going to be encased in a PVC pipe and buried under the soil right next to where the children are going to play. So that basically ends the story, but I just want to show you a few more pictures that's about this um, waterway and the bypass. So this is a picture of the before, <laughs> uh, before the construction. Uh, notice the fence up there. Uh, you can't really get in, it's very, it was very overgrown. And then you have uh, a picture during the construction, and I, I made these uh, lines, the red line is where the bypass is uh, buried, and the blue line is where the uh, water is going to flow. And the gray um, uh, columns protruding from the ground are access points for the bypass. And this is, these are pictures after the construction. Uh, you see the bypass, or you don't see the bypass because they're completely hidden, and the water is clean enough for, us, for the you know, children to play in. And it's very you know, nice and uh, people really like it. They, they come to this all the time. Um, but this is a photo, photo taken a few, year, few months back. And you see a little gray surface of the bypass showing from the soil. Uh, and because of erosion, the bypass became very visible. Now the uh, community volunteers who are involved in these initial talks uh, created this uh, twig fence, fence made out of twigs, in the hopes that sediment will accumulate and you know, behind it and cover the bypass again. So um, even though the volunteer group, you know, they're also in support of what the children was, was trying to say, which is to clean up the upper pond, uh, they in practice you know, end up becoming complicit in hiding this secret that the water from the upper pond is dirty. And it's very unfortunate because they actually, you know, want this uh, upper pond to be cleaned. Okay. So that, uh, this gets me to my second section, which is about the water, uh, wastewater pollution as a public secret. So this, um, this gets a little bit technical. I'll try to be very <laughs> uh, 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 quick about this. Uh, it's, it's a bit long, but here is a picture of the, uh, the river, Senpukuji River, which is downstream from the Osunoi River, the facility that I just showed you. And it looks clean. Um, and the local environments here are fond of saying, white flowers bloom after heavy rain. And, but they're saying this um, actually in, as a joke, as a tongue in cheek, because these flowers are actually toilet paper uh, from the sewage that flows into the river. And the local government, uh, local environmental activists talk about this phenomenon every time during, you know, when they give a tour to, uh, to citizens. And most residents do not know that sewage actually flows into uh, the, the river. And sewage you know, includes how, basically household sewage, so everything from shower water to dishwashing water to the water you flush down the toilet. Now, um, all this 
ends up in the ocean, as I mentioned earlier. And this is why, um, you know, when uh, they're applying the Tokyo Olympics, uh, there was widespread concern about bacteria in the Tokyo Bay. It's because of the sewage that flows into the river and ultimately out into the uh, ocean. And the reason that sewage enters the rivers in Tokyo is due to what is called combined sewage overflow. So what is that? Okay. Uh, this is a picture of an outfall uh, where the combined sewage overflows into the river. And in times of heavy rain, stormwater mixes with sewage that will pour out of this hole. Um, combined sewage overflow is often abbreviated as CSO. And so that's, a, that's how I'll talk about this. Now, uh, this is how CSOs work. There are two types of sewage systems, combined sewers and separate sewers. Again, I'm going through this very quickly. So uh, please let me know um, in the Q&A if you want me to explain this again. But on sunny days, sewage goes into the treatment center, no problem for both the system. Um, but during storm events, when there's a lot of rain, the combined sewers cannot handle the extra volume of storm water. So it has to release that into a nearby river. Now with a separate uh, sewer sewage system, the storm water and the, uh, the sewage is separated. So there are no problems with that. The, the sewage does not go into the river. Uh, and most newer cities have a separate sewer system. But older cities such as London, New York, and Tokyo have combined sewage because it was faster and cheaper to build back then. And uh, that was the available technology at that time and you know, much less people uh, before. So Tokyo CSO contributes significantly to the pollution of the river and it costs a lot to turn combined sewage into separate sewage. Now, um, this is related to human waste management that has changed in Japan after World War II. And you know, before this change, uh, night soil, you know, human feces and urine was used by farmers as fertilizer. So it was very, you know, uh, there was a cycle uh, recycling going on. But um, during Japan's economic expansion, as farms switched to chemical fertilizer and population of, to of Tokyo exploded, it resulted in a literal backlog in human waste. So when you read um, local city planning of this time, you, you read a lot about how people are complaining about the sewage flooding in the streets during heavy rain. So this is something that, was, that they had to deal with and flooding was one of the major, the other major problem that you know, is, is being dealt with, right? Now, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, flooding here. Uh, this is an aerial view of the Zembekuchi River. And you notice here, it's very straight. This is a contemporary. Uh, recent photo, a few years back, I think, and the buildings, you know, are also, you know, very um, dense. And this is a picture from about uh, the 1950s. Uh, it's probably American airplanes taking this during the occupation. And you see that the uh, river is very squiggly, right? They, they meander. And also notice that around the river is, are you know, these squares and they're rice paddies. So they're you know, very wet uh, land areas. So that has changed to this, right? Uh, and this is called channelization of the river, right? straightening and deepening of the river so that the water will flow faster out to sea. And this is great when you want to drain water away from an area. And with, it, with an area prone to flooding, this is something that you really want to do. Uh, and this is also something that's done during uh, urbanization. Uh, so before the transformation, right? So there were enough surface area that soaked up water. Uh, the left-hand side is the before picture, if you can imagine. But now with so much of the surface covered in concrete and asphalt, this is, you know, urbanization on the right-hand side, we end up having more serious flooding problems. So if you're able to follow me this, follow me, uh, this far, you're probably very confused now because I was just saying that channelization was a way to avoid flooding. But now I'm saying, you know, on the picture on the right, it's actually causing flooding, right? And this is actually one of the problems. This is one of the secrets that I'm talking about here, that this type of engineering is now known to, to exacerbate urban flooding. And the government has a difficult time admitting this because they've spent so much uh, uh, capital, so much effort to turn this left-hand side picture. I mean, this, these are pictures um, of areas that are really close to this river, actually, to you know, what you see on the right-hand side, this very dense urban uh, you know, metropolis. 
So to go back to the bypass is cheating, right? If you can imagine bypass as a kind of symbolic um, uh, symbol, right? Then you can think of it as a symbol of the kind of civil engineering that has cheated nature in order to make Tokyo more livable for its inhabitants, prevent floods, deliver clean water, and so on. Uh, it might also be a symbol of incredible ingenuity, technical prowess, and the capital that has gone into putting together this immense hydrological network of steel and concrete and plastic, right, which tries to replace the function of the natural hydrological cycle. You can also think of it as a, a symbol of the technological and ideological lock-in that right, has made it almost difficult to maintain the status quo even if there are many engineers, scientists, government officials, politicians, and community leaders who can imagine otherwise, who want to improve this, even then it's still very difficult to get away from this uh, particular lock-in. Right? And, and it's a symbol ultimately of the attempt to eat the cake and have it too. So you can see that the children's sentiment has great resonance, a sort of critique that is born out of a frank engagement with a field-based science. I mean, they actually went into the river and they were you know, testing out these theories that they learned in classroom in a healthy disregard for the lies that adults tell themselves. And that leads me to part three. This is going to be a short part about um, Ido Leopold. And I wanted to mention him because the children's critique really resonated uh, for me and reminded me of what Ido Leopold said. Now, some of you may, uh, know him uh, as a North American ecologist who is an influential figure in the field of uh, environmental studies, con conservation biology, wildlife management. Uh, he's also um, noted sometimes as the father of nature restoration. And his most famous book is a Sand County Almanac, uh, published in 1949, uh, which chronicles the time working, you know, him working as a forester and wildlife manager as well as his work to restore and overexploit farmland with his family in Wisconsin. Um, you know, some, many of his, his uh, chapters in this book are taught in um, modern environmental ethics classes, environmental studies classes, uh, and is you know, considered to be canon in this field. But I wanted to introduce here uh, a few quotes from a lecture that he gave at the University of Wisconsin uh, College of Engineering in 1938, okay. uh, so let me read this here. We end, I think, at what might be called the standard paradox of the 20th century. Our tools are better than we are and grow better faster than we do. They suffice to crack the atom, to command the tides, but they do not suffice for the oldest task in human history to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, um, I'm bringing this lecture up because it allows me to historicize the environmentalist critique of civil engineering. Right? The sentiment that he, Leopold, expresses uh, is you know, something that you hear even today, right? that large civic engineering projects such as dams and highways destroy the natural environment. But in Leopold's lecture, he's not uh, talking about these things in the abstract. Instead, he has a very specific qualm with the profession of engineering. And he says the following. At the present moment, however, the word engineer in the minds of some conservationists is associated with an attitude towards nature resources, which they dislike. It evokes in them a mental image of marshes needlessly drained of rivers expensively channel channelized to revive an expiring navigation of floods aggravated by stream straightening and by constricting levees of irrigation reservoirs silted before the maturity of their bonds and of a veritable mycelium of rows, at least a part of which are built regardless of cost or need. So you can see his, uh, his listing, marshes drained, rivers channelized. So this is used to drain marshes as well. Flooding uh, aggravated by levees and channelization. Like this is something that I just mentioned earlier. And so did irrigation reservoir and rows. And of these five things, four of them are directly related to water. Right? So you can see how water is a very important part of um, environmental conservation work. And, um, and so you know, Leopold's critique of the engineers focused on the vast hydrological change that was taking place in the American Midwest at that time. Uh, and by, by the change, what I mean by change is 
it was fueled by um, uh, the New Deal policies, right, of um, uh, of Roosevelt's and and money and ideology of improvement led to the transformation of uh, at the continental level almost, right, of these areas into something that looks like this. Right? They would drain uh, forests or cut wetlands or drain uh, prairies are repopulated with monocultural grassland, and it looks like this. Right now. Um, uh, the picture that you see now, you probably thought that this was a photo from the American Midwest. Actually, it is not. This is a photo that is from Hokkaido, which is the northernmost island of Japan, and it's the site of the case study that I will present uh, next. Okay. Uh, and um, the reason why I, I, I kind of slipped this picture into uh, discussion of the American Midwest and Aldo Leopold is because um, this is exactly what they tried to do. They tried to recreate uh, this American Midwestern kind of landscape in Hokkaido. And uh, you also will see that the same kind of process that Leopold criticized is at work. Uh, that leads me to my last part, uh, which is the tree planting uh, of uh, salmon fishers in Hokkaido. Okay. So, um, I will explain how citizen science and uh, among fishers led to tree planting, but more importantly, how their reaction led to the establishment of a, um, a regulatory scheme that concerns riparian forest buffers. And I'll explain what that is uh, later, an environmental assessment before civil engineering construction. So in this area of Eastern Hokkaido, there are many tree planting events involving fishing communities, which seem really strange, right? And why, why, why would, why would uh, fishing communities go and plant trees? Right? They should be go fishing somewhere. Um, but, but the origin of these events was in fact very local. Uh, in the 1980s, a women's group in the fishing community located at the mouth of this river, Nishibetsu River, led to the first Hokkaido-wide community uh, tree planting event. And Nishibetsu River is a famous salmon river and one of the first to have a modern salmon hatchery in Japan. Uh, now, just one uh, quick thing. FCA is a, an abbreviation for Fishery Cooperative Association. So I will use, also use that abbreviation throughout this, the rest of this talk. Now, uh, fishers planting trees in Hokkaido was not an isolated event, uh, nor was the idea of forests being beneficial for fisheries new in Japan. In fact, the connection between fisheries and forests has, has a long history. The term fish-bearing forest, wotsukiri in Japanese, was used in the Tokugawa period, which is the pre-modern uh, time in Japan, to refer to the protected coastal forest for increasing fish stock. And it appeared in the modern period as a legal category, revived in the 1930s when Professor Tetsuo uh, Inukai, um, a scientist at Hokkaido University, hypothesized that upstream logging was a key factor in the decline of the oyster fishery downstream. And this is the article that you see here in the middle, published in 1937, the uh, limnological study of Akechi Lake with special reference to the propagation of oysters. Uh, in recent years, these tree planting initiatives have become famous and the most important or most famous fisher forester in Japan is um, Hatakeyama-san, uh, Hatakeyama Shigeatsu, that you see here on the right-hand side, an oyster farmer from Miyagi Prefecture known for his slogan, forests are lovers of the sea. Uh, uh, fishery forest programs now appear across multiple government uh, agencies and ministries, and it's been conceptualized within the framework of uh, land-sea connectivity and community participation. Now, uh, behind these, you know, these initiatives of you know, fish bearing forests and fishers planting trees is the science that links um, salmon, rivers, and forests. Okay. And I'm showing here some works on the food web ecology surrounding salmon and forests, and I won't get into the details here, but they all point to the following. They, um, they say that forests help the fish because they stabilize water flow, uh, in the river, temperature, chemistry, erosion of sediment, these are all good things for the, for the fish. Uh, they also provide food, uh, benthic um, invertebrates is what you call them, but um, insects basically in the water uh, that the fish eat. 
and they also provide shelter for fish. So forests are great for the fish. And the fish also, the salmon also help forests grow because salmon spawning and uh, corpses carry important nutrients upstream to the forest. And this is something that scientists have tried to um, uh, really document in the last two or three decades. And these explicit, uh, and these are explicit examples of the salmon forest linkage used in specific conservation plans. The one on the top is uh, from California, the recovery strategy for California coho salmon. Uh, you can see the words repairing vegetation and salmon use. I won't read it, but it's basically you know connecting again uh, forest with salmon. And in uh, the bottom one is the Sakura Wild Salmon Project (SWSP). And uh, again, in this newsletter, they're connecting salmon with forest, right? So, the, so this is again a sci scientist and a uh, conservationist who are really connecting these two things together. So all this is to say that salmon fishers in Eastern Hokkaido, especially those who had connections uh, inside in, in the mountains and so on, um, and some of them are of Ainu. They said Ainu is a, an indigenous population uh, in um, Hokkaido region. Uh, knew of this link right, between, you know, of, of the forest and the salmon, uh, from maybe from experience, maybe from oral traditions. And their practice of planting trees uh, gave uh, social and political efficacy to this scientific idea and translated into a scalable, that is copyable community initiative and into policy. So the rest of my talk, uh, which I have about 15 more minutes, I guess, I'll try to be fast, but I will trace this history. Okay. Now, let me um, start off with a few maps. As you know, um, salmon, sea seafaring salmon travel down the river, out into the ocean, uh, where they spend a few years, they grow and they return to the river of their birth. Right. And this is called anadromous. So all anadromous salmonids uh, die right after spawning in rivers. There's one exception, the steelhead trout. They don't do that. But, uh, all the other ones, uh, anadromous salmon, salmonids do that. And the main species that is caught in Hokkaido is the chum salmon. Uh, pink salmon also comes up in Hokkaido as well, but it's mainly the chum salmon that uh, is, uh, is you know, really important for these fishers. And salmon obviously connects the various seas of the Pacific Ocean, the North Pacific. But because they travel, because these salmon travel up the rivers, they also connect the salmon, also connect the terrestrial ecologies of the North Pacific Rim, all the way from the you know, Koreas to Japan, even inland in the you know, North, North um, Eastern China, uh, obviously the Russian, Eastern Russia, uh, in Alaska, Canada, Pacific Northwest, down all the way to California. So we'll be talking about this part of Japan, the eastern region, uh, part of the island of Hokkaido. It's one of the colder regions of Japan. And in, in this picture, in this map, you'll see in the middle, uh, Nishibetsu River, right? And um, the blue line there is the river itself. Uh, now you can see how much of the region is, uh, is lighter green. That's actually all grassland, farmland for the cows, for the cattle. And this region is one of the largest producers of raw milk in all of Japan. At the uh, river's mouth is Betsukai, which is a fishing community that relies on the salmon. They're the ones who, uh, whose um, women's group initiated the tree planting events. And at the head of the river, right, on the right-hand side with the, um, uh, the, the salmon picture, right, is the Nishibetsu salmon hatchery. And, and right, right around there was also this uh, forest called Hagina Forest, which, is, which was an ancient hunting ground that was transformed into farmland. I'll talk about that at the very end. Now, uh, Nishibetsu River has been a salmon propagation river since the late 1800s. And what does that mean for a river to be a salmon propagation river? It's actually a legal sort of term. It means that these rivers have hatcheries and practice what is called fish ranching. Uh, and, and since the, the late 1800s, this river was transformed into basically an incubator 
we're producing salmon stock from you know from eggs and sperm and they fertilize it, incubate it, and they release the, the what's called fry or the babies into the, the river. And this was part of Japan's effort to modernize marine resource management. And I won't go into too much of the de uh, detailed history here, but um, Nishibetsu River was known as a salmon river even during the pre-modern times because the local Ainu tribes relied on the river for salmon and traded with the uh, the mainland um, Japanese, the shogunate, uh, they had an actual um, trade. Uh, and they, the rampant extraction of salmon during the early years of uh, the modern period resulted in the building of the hatchery, which is completed in 1890. The picture here is 1950s, I think, but the, the hatchery itself has a much longer history. And, um, and the letter that I have here um, is, is kind of a, a testament to that. You know that there was uh, salmon from this river that is uh, was being considered as a trade item, uh, and which was you know very necessary for Japan in order to um, to get obtain foreign capital. So um, I'm skipping a few decades now uh, to talk switching over from the salmon to farming. Um, in this area, there's a major transformation that took place in the 1950s. Um, dairy farming in Hokkaido began in the 1800s, but it wasn't until the end of the end of World War II, with a series of state-sponsored land reclamation projects, that the region became the largest producer of raw milk in Japan. Uh, the Konsen Pilot Farm Project, which is financed by a loan from the World Bank use bulldozers and tractors to transform woodlands and woodlands into farms. The project, which began in 1956, um, was based on an assessment that introducing into Japan, this is a quote, introducing into Japan techniques of rapid, large scale, low cost land reclamation appears to be a basic requirement for improvement of Japan's long-term food supply. And I won't read the, the you know this, this document, but this is the document from the World Bank, and you know you, you probably couldn't imagine Japan signing uh, or getting a loan from a World Bank now, but that's exactly what happened. This is one of the most uh, considered to be uh, the more successful uh, examples of a World Bank uh, project. Um, and here are some pictures from that time, and I I chose these ones in particular. Because you see on the left-hand side, um, the, the, the bull is a, is a tractor, I think, is, has the word John Deere. Uh, and you, some of you may know that's an American company of agricultural equipment. And on the right-hand side is um, a bulldozer that has, it's very hard to see, but it says Caterpillar. And Caterpillar is, again, you know, a US-based company that was and still is one of the largest makers of construction equipment in the world. And in fact, the Cal Caterpillar the company also made machines that helped build things like the Hoover Dam and other dams of the New Deal era in the United States, as well as you know, the dams and land reclamation projects here in Japan after World War II. Now, um, the 1956 World Bank land reclamation project was succeeded by another project in 1973, and this is a map from that later project, uh, which uh, was, I think, three or four times even you know, larger in terms of its scope. And this was part of a, um, a 1969 national law um, or plan called the New Comprehensive National Development Plan, uh, which uh, has this particular clause that I put into the slide here. It says, the development of lands that are low resource use into grasslands, as well as the construction of facilities that include co complexes of roads and settlements of large scale dairy operations. So they really wanted to develop this land into, um, you know, basically industrial large scale dairy agriculture that is very much similar to what you found in uh, the United States, the Midwest United States. And the plan included a threefold increase of dairy cows, right, uh, over 400,000 cows by 1980. And that's a huge number. Uh, you know, might, might think of cows and uh, we might not really be able to calculate, but imagine if, you, if those are human beings and it's a huge number uh, of, of, um, of cows. 
and of course that leads to a lot of waste that is produced. Right? So the transformation here is not simply a change in the landscape, but also the area's entire ecosystem. Right? The postal industrial dairy farms uh, spurred the trans-Pacific exchange of technology, genes, genetic matter, and nutrients. The program locked farmers, the, the, world, you know, the World Bank loans, for example, locked farmers into a controlled regimen of grass seeds and fertilizer for large-scale livestock production, uh, use of corn feed from North America, chemicals, fertilizers. Um, it's also a transfer of agricultural technology. Of course, the machines are also brought in from, from the um, United States. Now, replacing forests and wetlands with monoculture meadows of Kentucky bluegrass, which is also something that they brought in, deprived the land's capacities to store, purify, and deliver clean water to the coastal fisheries. And so the pollution was worsened as the huge explosion in the cattle population also meant excessive wastewater in rivers. Right? And this, of course, was something that the fishing community uh, noticed. So um, this is just one. Um, example of uh, such a report that was compiled by the Hokkaido Salmon Trout Protection Association in 1953. And the document starts off you know, wonderfully with this uh, very um, it's, you know, poetic statement, but with the population increase and advancing civilization, the trees were cleared and the land was plowed. Gradually, the rivers losing their original purity became a more difficult place to live for fish and other like. I, I translated this, but basically, uh, this is in Japanese, but you can see that they were very aware of the fact that this transformation in the landscape, so to say, the clearing of the trees and the wetlands would lead to some uh, problem with the rivers. But they couldn't really figure this out. Uh, they had a really hard time trying to figure this out. They could not um, focus on these more elusive effects of what is currently now called non-point source pollution. Um, I'll try to explain what that is. But um, um, here, yeah, they say that um, uh, this same report also admitted that the effects of organic chemical compounds are not well understood. Right? And the chemical compounds here, the organic compounds that they, that they refer to is the, um, the compounds that come from the farmland development. So this is in contrast to the inorganic chemicals. Heavy chemicals such as mercury, cadmium, you know, these are uh, major uh, you know, problems in terms of uh, uh, water pollution. But this reference to organic chemicals is things like soil erosion and the intrusion of wastewater, which are full of nutrient salts, nitrogen and phosphorus, which uh, when in excessive amounts uh, enter a body of water, it can result in what we today call eutrophication, which is a process that can cause algal blooms, hypoxia, which is the loss, uh, lack of oxygen, which kills um, fish, and neurotoxin production. So the investigators suspected a link between farmland development, forest loss, and water pollution, uh, but they failed to document it. Right? And because they were really concerned with um, point source pollution. And why is that? Right? Uh, uh, was it some gap in scientific knowledge? Was it a kind of a, a, a conspiracy? Well, one, one of the things that I suspect is because uh, point source pollution was grabbing the headlines uh, at that time, the news headlines. Um, the right hand, the left hand um, poster there called Minam of a picture, for a movie called Minamata starring Johnny Depp is about this um, American, I think, photographer Eugene Smith who uh, is famous for uh, taking some of the most iconic photographs of the Minamata disease, which happened in Kyushu. And there are also Minamata diseases in other parts of Japan. But this is a very famous example of mercury poisoning. Um, the, the people would eat the fish poisoned by mercury and they would end up um, becoming very sick. Some people died. Um, it was a neurological toxin, uh, neurological toxin. And this was a, um, a major um, event for fishing communities, obviously. So this is well understood within the fish, you know, the national uh, community of fish fishers. And, um, and you know, because of that, I think they're really focusing on non-point, I mean, point source solution like you know, uh, uh, pollution from a factory. 
And you see, this is another report in 1976, which is very telling of this bias toward point source solution, uh, point source pollution, rather, I'm sorry. The report was compiled by the Hokkaido uh, FCA, a pollution action committee, which is set up in response to the uh, second major farmland development project. And um, the sub subtitle there in Japanese, it reads, you know, um, uh, its influence on salmon fishery and hatcheries. And if we leave it like this, salmon will never come back. Right? So, but if you look at the photo here, what you see is, um, you know, something pouring into uh, some body of water, right? And the caption reads from a slaughterhouse run by uh, Nakashibetsu town to Masumi River. Right? So it's, you know, again, uh, the model, this is a point source model of pollution that they, they, they're focusing on. And it's really not, um, doesn't really, you know, get to the non-point non source pollution, which uh, uh, I don't think I defined it yet, but it was, it's this idea that it's a kind of pollution um, that has no source, a particular, no particular point source, but is um, coming in from everywhere. And um, one of the problems with nine point solution is that um, the science had yet to be developed uh, and its knowledge was yet to be translated into policy. So many of the models that the report investigators used in these reports, for example, were based on um, coefficients, models necessary for non-point pollution, right? um, uh, for point pollution. And um, moreover, the salmon forest with food web ecology that I was mentioning earlier was still a mystery. Right? And for the fishers, they probably understood intuitively, but for the scientists, they couldn't really figure out how to, how to translate that into science, into their language of science. Right? So the report's failure to fully deal with this effect of non-point pollution was only because of science. Um, and uh, while this was certainly an obstacle, there was also another aspect of this was the legal definition of pollution at that time. And there are many laws already at this point in the 1970s of um, water pollution laws that prohibited factories from polluting. Many of these laws were results of um, fishing communities that were protest that protested against fa uh, factory pollution. Uh, but again, the definition of pollution did not cover non-point source pollution. So, um, and then um, I'm already running out of time, but um, very quickly, I just wanted to mention one reason, another reason why uh, the fishing communities are very um, worried about their particular river was because of the, um, uh, at that time, the Japanese recognition of the, the economic, uh, inclusive economic zone, the UNCLOS uh, clause that says that, you know, uh, the country has a sovereignty within the 200 nautical miles. And, and this would prevent the uh, salmon fishers in this community from going really far out offshore fishing to catch salmon. They had to really focus on uh, the, the rivers that are close to them. So uh, they became you know, more involved in uh, the rivers that are close to them and this is one of the reasons why I think they were very intent on trying to um, fight this or to, uh, to lodge complaints against the uh, land development schemes that were happening at that time. Now, um, one of the um, um, technical consultants to the Spetskai FCA was this um, scientist, this technician named Takehiko Yaginuma he wrote this book to plant trees to, to breed fish. And he was also very instrumental in um, getting the younger fishers there to um, start to do some um, citizen science, to go up the rivers, to document all the pollution with their eight millimeter cameras, to do water quality testing and so on. And um, this episode is chronicled in this book. Now, after these negotiations on um, uh, 1973, the prefecture signed a memorandum of understanding that required that FCAs must be consulted before the implementation of any, any large scale projects affecting rivers, especially those with ongoing salmon propagation programs. Basically, right, this is a, a, a requirement for environmental assessment. So it's quite an uh, amazing, quite early in, in Japanese history 
uh, to have this kind of requirement. The memorandum also laid the regulatory groundwork for watershed-wide community involvement in decisions about civic civil engineering work that may disrupt the local hydrology. So, um, you know, the fishers uh, were given a mandate to conduct their own environmental impact assessment before the start of any river work. Um, these uh, pictures on the right hand here is the uh, is the picture of the agreement signing ceremony between the FCAs and the Hokkaido Prefecture. Now, another important aspect of this was the construct was the um, uh, was the agreement about riparian forest buffers. Now, riparian uh, buffers or riparian forest buffers are these strips of forests or trees or you know, woods that are right next to aligning the um, the riverbeds. And they're really useful in terms of preventing uh, sediment of, of going into the rivers. And as we talked about earlier, it also is you know, great for the fish. Right? So repairing buffers have become a key conservation tool for protecting rivers from land pollution. Uh, and in particular, it's used in agriculture areas uh, all over the world. Right? Uh, and in Japan, um, uh, while such trees have existed, there's no such law. Right? But in Eastern Hokkaido, an agreement was struck in 1974. It's one of, again, I think the earliest uh, cases of this kind of agreement in Japan. So the fishers were able to pressure the government to promise consultation with fishers and environmental assessment, uh, you know, which seems to be you know, really great. But um, however, um, one of the problems uh, was, again, the science. Uh, there was a, a gap between the accepted theoretical models of how to predict, uh, say, uh, pollution and the lived experience of the fishers that led to the continue, continuation of this uh, of land development schemes and in one instance, the raising of an ancient forest. Now, um, basically what happened here was the, you see the report on the left-hand side that says the watershed as a whole will not see any effect of neither sediment nor stormwater release. And it's just, you know, this is the kind of conclusion that they gave, although the fishers responded, and this is something that uh, was um, in a handwritten memorandum <laughs> that uh, you know, they, they responded by saying that the report's understanding of the groundwater mechanism is incomplete and the coefficients do not express the water retention capacity of force. I mean, they're really you know, trying to use or mobilize scientific knowledge in order to critique, to counter the arguments made in this uh, environmental assessment report. Uh, but they ended up not really uh, losing this battle. And this ancient forest that was once a fishing uh, uh, ground, I mean, a hunting ground for uh, the local communities there, that was completely chopped down. And it's because of that that. Um, um, that there is this grassroots initiative for fishers to start planting trees in the upper reaches of the Nishigatsu River. Um, let me just do one more thing. I know it's almost time, but I just wanted to show you one more thing. Um, I have a few more slides with the conclusion, but maybe I'll end with this one because it kind of sums at least the historical argument that I'm trying to make here, which is that um, uh, today, I described these two cases, the one in Tokyo, another one uh, in Eastern Hokkaido. Right? And while these are very different um, you know, cases in terms of time, in terms of community, in terms of history, uh, there are also many uh, shared commonalities to this. Uh, and in this talk, I try to highlight the, the different, um, especially the ecological changes taking place in both places, especially that of the water sample right? that is uh, caused by uh, changes in land use. Okay. And in both cases, the civil engineering projects were uh, disapproved by non-scientists who tried to base their criticism on their understanding of scientific expert knowledge, but that knowledge was imparted by other experts, other scientists who were really supportive of their cause, uh, I'm sorry, of their cause. Now, both the children as well as these fishers, uh, they had other scientists kind of backing them up and teaching them about the science. Now, us. Um, so let me um, end here. Uh, and um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me, there's something wrong with my video.
I think I need to un unshare, right? Yes, yes. If you unshare and I can start the Q&A. Yes, let me see if I can do that. Sorry. Thank you so much for the very rich talk. Really enjoy it. Um, so I just want to let the audience know that they can uh, type the questions into the chat box or they can use the raise hand function and I'll um, call on you and you can uh, switch on your video and ask your questions. So I guess I will be the first one. I have the privilege to ask you a few questions before people gather their thoughts and ask theirs. So what I find it like really interesting that you there are in a, like I think in both case studies, you've also mentioned about how they use the United States like the as kind of a model or they are after that sort of landscape. Can you give us a little bit more about the historical like an origin of why that is the case? Like why why in particular the, the landscapes in America that appeals to, to people in, in that way? Uh, th thank you for that question. Um, I think with the Hokkaido case, it really has to do, there's a long history of um, connection, at least in terms of agricultural industry between the, the Hokkaido-based agricultural agriculture and um, the Americans. Uh, this goes way, you know, goes back into the late uh, 19th century. Basically. I guess what, because your talk also talk a lot mm -hmm. about expertise. So I wonder if that if it's because people, the scientists, they were trained in the U.S. or is like what's that? So where does that hi historical influence come from? Is it because the experts they were trained in the U.S. or was it because there was some, I don't know, like the U.S. influence in, in what way it, it, the, the landscape became so a desired object for these people? You know, I really don't know how to answer that question <laughs> because I think um, uh, in the, before World War II, I think there's a lot of influence from not just America, America, America but also Europeans. There are a lot of European you know, scientists and engineers who came to Japan, like French and uh, especially the Dutch in terms of you know, water uh, technology. Uh, and they came and they, you know, they, they taught uh, young scientists in Japan and that's kind of how uh, there's a lot of European influence in, you know, and American influence in Japan. But in the post-war period, I think it really has to do with the, uh, the US occupation of Japan and how, um, and uh, again, I don't want to get too much into the history of this, but um, you know, the, the, um, the allied powers led by the Americans after, you know, after World War II, uh, they, had, um, uh, they wanted to really reshape Japan right, into a really good country, I guess, you know, in a country that would not fall back to the kind of fascist militarism. Right? So in order to do that, they, uh, you know, really wanted to do the kind of nation building uh, where they were um, kind of testing out their idealistic vision of what the nation could be. And I think part of that idealism comes from the successes of the, um, again, the New Deal, the FDR era. Right? So I think those things that are considered to be very successful at that time, you know, like the dams, like the reclamation projects, you know, were, um, used in the Japanese context. And I think that's, you know, that may be the historical sort of force that uh, have, have led at least in Hokkaido to, in that part of Hokkaido, uh, to be transformed into a kind of American looking landscape. Yeah. Thank you, that's very interesting because I was wondering like, why is it not the influence from, for example, Germany or like you say from the Dutch, um, but uh, I I will um, pass the pass the time to Gonzalo first. I think he has a question. Thank you so much, Tak. This was incredibly rich. Uh, you know, in two in 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 forty five minutes, two case studies is uh, is very is very uh, challenging. Uh, and 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 in a way, I mean, I have a couple of questions, but I'm uh, because I felt that you didn't quite elaborate towards and the sort of parallels be, between the two case studies. I think I would, I would like to start there. I'd like to push you a little bit more into trying to um, 
explain what do you think are the the parallels between the two case studies and and what exactly is your historical argument um you know what, what are you planning to uh to tease out as the historical argument surrounding these two case studies could you tell us a bit more your thoughts on that? yes yes um um, thank you for this opportunity to continue, I guess, continue with my, with my talk, basically. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to tease out is this idea that, you know, the science is really, uh, it's very mysterious, right, for, for the layperson. It's really hard to understand, and it's really obf obfuscating, and it's really hard to, uh, if, a, if the state the state scientists, if the government scientists, if the officials, you know, put out this you know one thousand page report that is you know investigating the river, or investigating the, the fishery grounds, uh, you know it's really hard for uh, uh, a citizen, a local person, to respond to that. And um, I think that is very similar in both cases. Uh, that you know, there are these um, these structures of knowledge that's really protected by the government, by laws, by these systems. And, um, and, on, and on top of that, there is also the actual, and because these are la large scale projects, you know, these are infrastructural projects, uh, civil engineering projects, they stay. I mean, they have such lasting impact. Um, you know, it's not like uh, some, it's not like, um, a digital um, image or something. It actually is in people's lives and it stays for a very long time. It's kind of like, um, I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I had this whole section about Lu uh, Lewis Mumford and his whole discussion of, of the technology and civilization. And he, um, in one of his writings, mm -hmm. he equates Hoover Dam uh, as um, a kind of pyramid. You know, for the like like the Egyptians, I mean, it has such lasting impact that um, it's very difficult, I think, for local citizens to fight against that in a way, uh, even if it's something as small as a hundred meter creek. And that's one of the things that I was trying to um, to tease out. That, you know, even that there was this kind of, at least in terms of the story of this, right? Um, that it was um, um, a, a very um, difficult thing for these people to try to critique. And the only way that they try to be able to do so is through um, learning science on their own. And trying to kind of really incorporate uh, or understand the science, try to interpret their own experiences uh, through this language, this expert language of science that they, you know, that they didn't have at the, at, at the beginning. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, um, and this has to do with the title of, of um, the secret politics part, right? I was trying to figure out how to connect this to the idea of secrecy. And I'm really drawn to this, um, this idea that, um, that, again, technical language is so difficult to understand. It's almost like, you know, ha having this, um, these priests in the temple with their, you know, with their very um, intricate secret that they're protecting, right? That no one else can actually understand. Um, and this is kind of the image that I have about these scientists with this very, you know, technical understanding, technical knowledge. And, um, and yet, you know, there's also this other kind of um, secret that's happening or secrecy that's happening with something like pollution. And everyone knows that the rivers smell in, in Tokyo, right? And everyone knows this, and yet they don't talk about it. They don't really, it's not, doesn't really register as something that's important to them when in fact it should really be. And it's something like, you know, when you have um, the Olympics and people start to say that the Tokyo Bay is very polluted, but they, for the first time, realize, you know, that the river that runs right next to their house is, is very polluted. So um, 
And once you start having this kind of um, um, process or, or mechanism of, of a public secret that no one really wants to say anything about, then it normalizes that, I think. It, you know, it, it prevents any kind of criticism in a way. And that's also something that I found in both, both you know, situations. Uh, the, land, the farmland development in Hokkaido was so normalized. It was, you know, it was the Americans coming in. It was, you know, uh, the Japanese government is also backing it. The, 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 uh, the World Bank is backing it. It must be a good thing, right? <laughs> and uh, the land, land, landscape is transformed. Maybe the first generation might see that as very strange. But by the time you have second and third generation, this is also part of the infrastructural changes because infrastructure takes a long time. Um, it stays for a long time. So once you have a generation that doesn't remember that past image, then it really does become normal for them. And it's that kind of normalization, um, even if they understand it, even if they know that things are a problem, they still will understand it as something that's very normal. And um, to, to, how do you deal with that? How do you cope with that? How, how do you critique that? That's very hard to do. And, um, the children for me were really uh, an eye opener because they, you know, they don't care. Uh, they don't care about you know, games. They don't care about etiquette. They don't care about you know, feelings of the adults. So <laughs> they just say what they want to say. And that was very refreshing for me. So, I don't know if I answered your question, but just some of the themes that I was thinking about. Can I just follow up very quickly on this, Loretta? Please, if, uh, yeah. help me. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, f I find very meaningful that you're choosing, you know, Aldo Leopold and, and Mumford as, you know, sources of inspiration to your discussion. Because in a way, at least on the American side, you know, they do represent sort of a first uh, wave of, you know, critical critical rethinking of technocratic expertise. I mean, they, they were amongst the first uh, to develop that critique. I mean, in Europe, we also had the Adorno school and so on and so forth, but you know, they are amongst that kind of wave. And I think it would be interesting for you to think about the historicity of the argument that you're making and what does it mean to criticize technocratic expertise today, almost 100 years after you know, Mumford and, and, and Leopold. In other words, is there anything new about the way, you know, technocratic expertise works today? And one of the things that, you know, immediately came up to me, especially when you, when you were talking about your first case study is how, you know, engineering, um, you know, uh, technocratic expertise is capable of constantly reinventing itself and uh, you know, somehow seducing political power that you know they came up with some kind of viable solution. Um, and I'm thinking, um, you know, a, about a notion that is particularly you know prominent in China. And you know, I was struck that you're not mentioning in in Japan. So I wonder if that's the case or not about the sponge city, the sponge city as a way to solve the kinds of problems of, fl of flooding in urban environments that you're talking about. You know, I remember when I was living in Hong Kong, one of the things that I did with my students was to kind of get them to visit underground stormwater storage infrastructures that were built right in the middle of Hong Kong to kind of absorb uh, rainwater from typhoons, right? Uh, and this was, of course, being represent, you know, introduced in the 21st century as the new solution for the problems that had been created by previous solutions, right? You know, so uh, in the context of fast-paced urbanization, and I find that I think it's one of the one of the the amazing, uh, well, amazing in the sense, you know, amazing capacities of engineering knowledge to kind of constantly present itself as, as a solution, even when the solution that is being proposed is for a problem that has been created by previous engineering solutions. And I think that's really um, interesting. But any, anyway, a sponge city in Tokyo, is, that, is there talk about uh, solutions like this today? Yeah, again, this is something that I, I would have talked about a lot more if I had time. Um, but yeah, 
That's right. Thank you for that suggestion. Spun City is something that um, um, it's probably coming through a lot of this discussion of urban planning uh, and you know, management of stormwater comes from, at least from for Japan, it comes from, again, the US. Uh, there's, uh, there's um, Seattle and Portland seems to be like the main destination for these engineers and planners. Um, and um, so the idea of Sponge City, which I know is something that, you know, is, is a very big thing in, in the case of China, but I also hear this word and I know there's um, sort of a sponge park in New York and there are a few other, you know, things like that. Um, so these are, it's really interesting how this whole discourse of stormwater management, management is very global in scope. And um, the Japanese planners, engineers, the government, they're also picking up on this language. And um, so it's very, and I was, there's another picture that I wanted to show you um, in which the, act, the, the children's children design waterway that I, that I was mentioning, that was actually showcased in a, um, a, um, a, a poster for a World Bank sponsored event about exactly about this, about the um, you know, flooding, urban flooding. Uh, so you know, they're, they're obviously really interested in this idea of you know, having a waterway. Um, they didn't mention much about children. <laughs> they mentioned about you know, this fact that there is this kind of uh, very um, nature-based solution, so to say, in the middle of Tokyo. So that's something that is happening right now. The, the national government's picking up on this discourse. The, the Tokyo government, metropolitan government is uh, just recently, uh, they've started to, to also talk about it. And so it's trickling down into the, the local the ward government level as well. They're starting to get interested in this. In fact, that's something that they're, they're talking about right now, I think, in the, in the, um, the local parliament. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, thank you. But um, to going back to this uh, question of um, that you raised, which is really fascinating about um, you know, why Leopold and Mumford instead of you know, Adorno and sort of the European uh, post-war critique of you know, technocracy. I, um, I don't know, I didn't really think about it too much, except um, obviously there's also a kind of critique in Japan as well, right, of this kind of technology. But it was a very different kind of critique than I think the ones that you saw in something like, somebody like um, Adorno or uh, Hannah Arendt or you know, even Heidegger, right? It's a very different kind of critique in that um, the mainstream Japanese critique of pre uh, of fascist, you know, militarist use of technology, so to say, was that <clears throat> they didn't go far enough. Actually, that um, and this is this comes from the American influence, I think, that you know, because Japan was still a backward feudal country, it was because of the the inability to fully complete their modernization process. So they were not fully modern, so to say, if I, if I, you know, I guess it's kind of like a tour, but they weren't fully modern. So therefore they uh, weren't able to, to enjoy the, the fruits of technology, of science. And because of that, because these sort of pre-modern uh, traits, elements in the system, that they end up becoming fascist. So it's, it's, it takes a very different kind of turn than I think the kinds of um, arguments that are made by Adorno and Heidegger and so on the Frankfurt School. It's, it's, I, I didn't think about it that way, but that, now I think about it, it's very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yi Chang, you have a question? Yes, thanks, Lorita. Thanks, Tak, for this very wonderful talk. And, and it's exactly what I expected, that your talk is brilliant and wonderful. Um, and I, I was just uh, very uh, intrigued by you know some of the puzzles that you helped solved uh, for me. Like for example, in major cities in in China um, these days, if there's a heavy rain and then there must be a flood that kills people in a sense that people have to you know uh, climb out of their cars and then take a boat 
on the street in a sense to to get somewhere so so it's like uh, you know something that is really interesting to for everyone actually in the city to think about but then nobody really you know talks about it in a sense you know that in a public way as, as you just uh, uh, indicated. And then also, I, I also was just intrigued by, you know, the secret correlations between like uh, milk, like cows and, and also salmons, uh, you know, that, that we, we we take for granted as, you know, produced in Hokkaido, but actually they are kind of interrelated uh, at an ecolo ecological sense. So so my question was more about, you know, uh, so 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 because you know what what you described are very kinds of what we call the local knowledge, so so it's like the local not just in the sense of you know in Japan or in the space, but then also it's, it's something that is very you know ecological that is grounded. So so I was thinking whether um, is that a secret that is not uh, being solved by you know technocratic kind of engineering or is it more like a kind of the ecological ways of knowing that should be there, but supposed like not actually there in the, in the current ways of scientific productions globally. So I was asking that is because that because for, for example, when we study medicines, and there are some local ways of medicines are not just being translated well enough into kind of, uh, you know, the global knowledge of medicine. So, so I was just wondering, uh, because I, I have no idea of what the uh, uh, current scientific productions of the ecologies or environment studies are, but I was just wondering if there's, uh, you know, any uh, thing that's related with, you know, just the fact that uh, scientific productions are not very inclusive of this kind of uh, ways of thinking. Thanks, Yijian. Um, that's a really good question, and I don't know how to answer that, except to say that it's probably different in different contexts and you know, different um, situations. Um, in, you know, in, um, in the Hokkaido case, um, I don't know if, I mean, certainly local knowledge of fisher, fisher communities is something that is um, often talked about, often discussed. But you know whether that gets how much of that is translated into uh, scientific knowledge is, is something that um, is, I don't know if it's it's difficult to gauge. Except in this particular case, <laughs> right? Um, there was really effort by the government to try to get the fishers to be scientists themselves, and then. That since the and this is part of the discussion that I kind of uh, went too quickly, so I probably didn't it really um, explain enough. But um, because of the shrinking of the fisheries due to Japan's recognition of the uh, Convention of the Law of the Sea, which you know has to do with the EEZ and so on, they lost a lot of fishery grounds. Uh, they compensated by giving subsidies to the fishers. And one of the things that happens, at least in community that I was looking at, uh, is um, is that they hired a lot, you know, they hired uh, scientists who can go and help them out and to kind of start to implement scientific management of fisheries and so on. And um, that that led to, you know, local fishers, at least who are interested, they're really learning about the fishery science, marine science and fishery science. So there's that kind of um, a learning process, which then I think resulted in them, some of them at least becoming very interested in uh, using the same tools of investigation to go and you know, um, prove some of the things that they already knew about you know, their, the fish that they're catching, about the river that they, that they know about. So, um, so I think in that sense, it's, it's um, and then you have the technicians who are also helping out the, you know, the scientists who are helping out the fishers, and then they're able to translate those local knowledge into the scientific language. Right? So when you have that kind of situation, I think it's very um, productive in some ways, at least in terms of the production of knowledge. Whether that knowledge is good or not, I don't know, but it's, you know, it's, it is producing that kind of knowledge. Um, I think it's sort of the same thing with the, the urban case as well, the urban you know, waterway case, 
in that there are you know, local activists who are not really scientists, right? Uh, but they work with you know, other scientists to, um, to make certain claims or, or to document certain observations about what's going on. And um, one of the things that I was trying to figure out, and I, it's, I don't know how to do this yet, but is that um, it's really hard to draw that line between scientists and non-scientists. I think that's probably, that's, what's, that's where I'm having trouble with, right? Because you have, not, you have citizens, what you might call citizens, but they all, you know, they all know science through high school, right? Through, <laughs> through their education. So they're all scientists in a way, right? But, um, but then the experts are there, they're coming in and, um, and they can either talk to them in sort of regular, normal, language or they can talk to them in this very uh, bizarre language of science and uh, but either way you know it's it's um you know if they're able to if the scientists are adept enough in talking to in in sort of an everyday language and right, sort of the local language then um it, there's a very fruitful collaboration that can take place if not it's really difficult so um that i that's kind of, you know, for me, really fascinating. So these terms, like, um, I was, just to give you one example, I, um, uh, one of the terms that I didn't end up talking about is this notion of flavor of rivers, which is a term that uh, one of these fishing uh, women who, you know, who helped organize the first tree planting ceremony, uh, she's, um, she's close to 80 now, I think, and she was telling me about how, you know, back then they were really worried about how uh, about how the um, the land development projects were changing the flavor of the river. That's the word that she actually used, right? And you know that term is a very kind of I don't know. It makes a lot of sense to me, right? Because you can think of the the salmon trying to sniff its way back into to the river, and so they're trying to you know sniff or taste, I guess, the the smell of the river. Right? So that made sense to me, but. You know, how does that translate into science? I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, there are ways to talk about. There's, there are ways that scientists can talk about the changes in the water quality. Right? And that may be one way of translating that term. But, and, and that's probably what, how they thought about it, you know, this idea of the flavor of the river. But this is a term, again, that, some, that, that I heard many times uh, in, this, in that particular instance. Well, thanks, Ethan. This is uh, the idea of local knowledge and how that translates, and also the relationship between um, citizens and non citizens, uh, scientists and non scientists. It's really fascinating. Thank you. That's very wonderful. Thank you. So, uh, the next question comes from Serene Pitulot. Hi. Um... Thank you very much for organizing this event and, and uh, for this fascinating talk. Uh, my name is Sirian Pitoulou. I'm um, a Swiss postdoc, uh, actually um, having a pro uh, project in, in Paris on um, pollution in, in modern Japan. So I'm, I'm very much interested in in your work, of course, and I, I know what you what you wrote about uh, the Beshi mine and stuff like that. And um, I was wondering to to go on uh, about this this discussion our, around uh, science. Um, basically, one of the things I've tried to show in 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 my uh, PhD was that there was. Um, uh, in, in the conflict about uh, a, a very famous conflict about a, uh, a, a copper mine in Japan, the Ashio one, there was already this and this um, um, struggle between expertise and by, by the authorities and, um, and local knowledge or, or uh, scientific um, who were sympathizers of the cause, which is, of course, something not entirely new and um, I was uh, very much inspired by your own work. Um, and the question I usually uh, receive when I try to make this argument is, yes, but how do, what do the, the local population know about um, science? What, what is their exposure to scientific knowledge? 
And um, first, that's a kind of a tough question to answer because you, you don't know exactly what people had for an idea of, of science at the time. But listening to your, to your talk today, I, I, I have the impression that um, we are at the same point <laughs> sometimes. Because um, as uh, Gonzalo Santos mentioned, there is always this capacity of um, technocratic um, authorities to also um, make new, um, how to say that, to, to have new statements about uh, how things work. And also they have their own language that is, which is difficult to, to appropriate for, for a local population. And, of course, there is a difference between um, local population in Meiji Japan and, and the, the kids you mentioned today who have access to um, scientific education. But still, I think it's rather a matter of legitimacy rather than instead of um, exposure or um, um, a control of, of science. And I just wanted to, uh, to ask you, uh, how, how do you put that in perspective, the, um, the long term, so to say, the, the, the long historical narrative of um, scientific, scientific uh, controversies and, and this struggle between local uh, population um, ask, well, asking for help to, to, um, to also experts who, who are sometimes uh, also um, very legitimate experts, but who still have difficulties. And that's why I was also very interested in your, in your uh, idea of um, secrecy or yeah, public secret, who, which is not exactly a secret, but thank you, that, that was fascinating. And I don't know if it made much sense what I was trying to say, but maybe you have some thought about it thanks Sirian, thank you so much that's that's uh, made me think of a lot of issues one uh is um right talk thinking about the narrative and maybe the future direction that this may go right but it's um the one of the things that again i didn't really have a chance to talk about is how um the children in the first case of the, you know, the tokyo urban waterway um, in some ways, this was a kind of deliberate strategy on the part of the activists to use the children in a way to, um, to push forth their agenda. And, um, but I mean, not in a kind of nefarious way, but it just kind of worked out that way, I think. And it, that worked out for the better. But I think there, you know, these people who are um, kind of the environmental activists, so to say, they are very um, concerned about children, basically. I mean, they're really, you know, what they wanted to do is, you know, they have their own experience of, of playing as a child in nice rivers, but current children, the contemporary kids, they don't have that experience, so they wanted their kids to, you know, those kids to also experience what they experienced when they were kids. So it was a very honest kind of effort on their part to get them to think about the river and, and get them to experience the river. Uh, one of the ways that, one of the only ways that they can actually go into these urban rivers is by, by um, saying that this is for education. Uh, it was, you know, you can't go in the river for play. You can only go in the river because it's all, you know, it's the access is blocked. The government is controlling it. The only way you can go into these rivers is for educational purposes. So, so, uh, so you have to teach something. <laughs> so, kind of, so that kind of, uh, there's a natural progression of that into, into the science of things. But also, um, you know, because of that, uh, there was this other discourse, and this is, you know, kind of the, the Greta Thunberg kind of discourse of, of, you know, what, what, if you think about intergenerational ethics and the future of, you know, of the planet and so on, then, um, you know, are we really doing, um, you know, something good for these children or not. And I think that also plays a lot into um, the legitimacy question that you just raised, right? But um, 
that these uh, efforts are legitimate because these children are going to be the future leaders, uh, the people who are going to raise their children so that their children can also enjoy these rivers. Um, one other point, and this is more of a sociological point, I think, is that um, the children are really, uh, they're really at the center of these communities because with the children in school comes the school itself. So you have the teachers, you have the whole board of education there, uh, which is connected to the government. You have the parents, the parents are also connected to their own, you know, households and so on. You have these sort of uh, civic communities. Uh, there are these, you, you know, these um, chonaikai, right? these neighborhood associations that are also connected to these efforts. So this, the children become really central to this whole uh, social network that exists at a very, very local level. So in that sense, it's also strategically very, um, I think, useful <laughs> to, have to mobilize children in, in these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. So we are bang on time. Um, so if there's no last very quick question, I'm going to end this session. And I want to thank uh, Professor Tak Watanabe for giving us such a rich talk. It's really interesting. And so um, I think this is the last, I think this is the last um, seminar for this uh, academic year. So we'll come back in September. So thank you very much for your support. And if you have any questions about, or want to give us a talk about your own research, send us an email and we'll, uh, look forward to more collaboration with people um, across the world. So thank you very much today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, thank you so much for, for, for a wonderful opportunity again. Really wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.